everyone, and thanks for joining us for France Awakens Week. My name is Mireille, and I'm very happy to welcome you to the Inside the VIP Experience with and at Centre Pompidou. And with VIP, in this case, stands for very important pieces, because these iconic works of modern and contemporary art have been selected from the 120,000 works in the Centre Pompidou collection, which is the largest in Europe. Now this virtual experience is part of the Tickets Awakening Week, a six week celebration of the reopening of over 100 museums and attractions in six countries around the world. These venues have worked day and night to reimagine their experience and introduce new hygiene measures to make it safe to uh, visit again. <laughs> now these venues are rolling out the welcome mat with these online experience for those who aren't able or willing to travel yet, but still want to experience and reawaken cultural institutions worldwide. We will start the experience of um, Centre Pompidou very soon now, but as people are still joining us, I will kick us off by sharing some logistical information and what to expect and how to use the Zoom that you're currently uh, using. If you have any questions for the presenter, you can submit them through the Q&A button at the bottom in the center of your Zoom window. You will also have the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. So please feel free to uh, send in your questions and we will try to answer them um, as many as possible at the end of the session. Uh, you can also vote for your favorite question by giving a thumbs up so that we can make sure to ask uh, the best questions first. This is a Zoom webinar, so your camera will not be on, but you can use the chat to communicate with fellow attendees and the speakers. So uh, you can, for instance, share where you're joining us from or your reactions during the, the sessions by using the chat to message all panelists and attendees. If you have any technical difficulties, use the chat and send a message to all panelists and we will try to solve uh, the problem as soon as possible. Um, if you're facing um, trouble with the audio, uh, usually leaving the, the, the meeting and then rejoining again is, uh, is basically the easiest way to fix the problem. Um, it could also be that uh, when our host is moving from rooms within the venue, we would, might lose internet connections or audio connection. So please bear with us when that happens uh, because this is an experience you don't want to miss out on. And then finally, this presentation will be recorded and we will be share, uh, sharing and sending the recording to all registrants in the coming week. Now, with further ado, I'm happy to hand over to our host of this virtual experience. Olivier is going to transport us to the world of Europe's largest modern art museum and let you rediscover the treasures of Centre Pompidou. Olivier, you can take it away. Thank you, Mario. Uh, bonjour. Um, welcome to the Pompidou Center. We are right in the middle of Paris. Uh, it definitely is an institution now, a monument in the Parisian landscape. Uh, the building is 43 years old. It has been created by two major, major architects, uh, the Italian Renzo Piano and Sir Richard Rogers. Uh, be sure about one thing, when it opened, it was really shock for the Parisians to see this or raffinery that was one of the nicknames given to the building. Uh, shows the belly outside. I guess it's what characterized the most the building. Now, just like the Eiffel Tower or Notre Dame, which is our famous neighbor, our Lady of the Tubes, another nickname of the Pompidou Center, is really a symbol of art in uh, Paris. Uh, devoted to modern and contemporary art, the museum is really the heart of the building. Uh, we mostly present modern collections starting from 1905 and going up to the 60s on the fifth floor, where I'm actually standing. And on the fourth floor is devoted to uh, contemporary sections. Of course, you imagine it starts in the 60s, 70s and goes to nowadays. Um, it's very difficult to choose what are supposed to be uh, the main pieces of the collections. 
As Mario told you, we have more than 120,000 works in our collections. We regularly change the hangings, and I will try to show you, that's my subjectivity talking, um, a few of those VIP pieces. Uh, we, are just like other museums, are very proud of some pieces who are part of these collections, and it will be my pleasure to uh, share this uh, moment with you. So, maybe um, as we get inside the museum, it's time for you to see a little video of the Pompidou, because we don't have the possibility with the camera to show the entire building. The historians are fighting to decide when modernity is supposed to start. We begin our collections in 1905 with the full movement, color, and the use of a specific way is really the beginning of uh, modernity in our collections. In 1907, the shapes will change. Cubism will be the second movement that introduced modernity. It's very interesting to look at the work of Fernand Léger, when this particular painting, dated 1948, combines the specific use of modern colors and shapes. Uh, he was once very attracted by a cubist movement, but more than the angles, cubes were one of the characteristic elements that are on display on his works. The poet Apollinaire said that he was the most cubist of all the cubists. We really recognize the specific shapes in the characters developed on this painting called Leisure Time. Uh, in 1936, the French were extremely happy to have holidays that were paid. It's time to enjoy the summertime. People were with bikes going on the summer uh, on the beaches. But then came World War II. After the war, people are trying to reintroduce this way of life, this joie de vivre. This is what uh, Fernand Léger wants to paint on this specific painting. He really wants to be uh, a popular painter. And in this idea, he wants to paint popular subjects. The group of friends, the bikes are there to show those specific elements. But in the same way, he wants by his style to simplify the things. He says to have an access to the people, you must simplify things. The tubes, the shapes, and the bright colors are some of the elements he developed strongly after this time. Using mostly primary colors, the contrast are very strong. And this idea of simplification is also making an echo to a painter he admired this time. David, a famous French painter, was known for having a simplified shapes the lady standing on the first plan is making an echo to a famous painting made by Marat that you can see in another famous place in Paris, in Le Louvre. Uh, those are some of the elements who are on display. Our collection of Fernand Léger is extremely wide. We are very pleased to show an amazing number of works from this uh, essential painter that was also a teacher in the Montparnasse area uh, many painters have been developing their talents according to the wills and uh, uh, expressions of Fernand Léger. 
Maybe uh, have a look at uh, some of the other rooms in the collections. The first decades of the 20th century are extremely chaotic. In a very short time, painting is dramatically changing fast. Shapes and colors, as I told before, were elements that were fundamental in the way painting changed. But as soon as the tense, abstraction will appear. Robert Delaunay is definitely known for dealing with all those propositions. If you look at uh, Le Manège de Cochon, merry-go-round with pigs, you can maybe imagine that this is an abstract painting. Characteristic of his works are the big circles developed with contrasted colors, but a few details are maintaining this painting with reality. You can see right in the center some legs that seem to appear Going up or down, it's very difficult to uh, introduce us an idea of gravity. And the character below, with this hat and the monocle, is also um, linking this painting with some precise subjects. Uh, Delaunay think like some Italian painters, that if you want to be modern, you have to develop modern subjects, movement, light, Machines were some of the subjects developed by the futurist. He's amazed, like many other painters, about the city life. The lights were extremely impressive. Some balls were extremely popular, where the electricity light bulbs were illuminating the characters. In fact, close to Montmartre was a merry-go-round called Le Manège de Cochon. Uh, dealing with gas and lights, it was an attractive place for many painters. Those legs were here, where some of the ladies that were jumping on this merry-go-round and just like some other, at other times, were going to Le Moulin Rouge, looking at the ladies. You uh, have this uh, illusion. Tristan Tsara is the poet who presented down. Uh, Robert and Sonia Delaunay, a couple of famous artists, had in Tristan Tsara a very good friend. Tristan Tsara is also known for being uh, an important poet in uh, the movement Dada, in the Cabaret Voltaire, and that a little bit later with the Surrealist group, he will be extremely active. Uh, Robert Delaunay shows on this painting the temptations of abstractions and movements and shapes and colors, but still linked with reality. If you want to see a definitely abstract painter, we'll have a look at Kadinsky, which is one of the major artists of our collections. Vasily Kadinsky is very often considered as one of the pioneers of abstraction. Why maybe abstraction appeared? Uh, for Kadinsky, uh, the fact is that uh, he was a little bit disappointed in a certain way by painting. Like some others, he was thinking that music was maybe a major art compared to painting. Why? Because music gives you emotions and don't need to represent things. At the beginning of the 20th century, the fauves changed the colors, but they are still depending on their subject about reality. The cubists changed the shapes, 
but they're still depending on subjects linked with reality. Maybe there could be an equivalency that could be done between music and painting. And Avec l'Arque Noir is one of the keys solved by Kandinsky. Maybe that color could be the equivalent of a sound and maybe lines could be the equivalent of rhythm. In the compositions developed after 1910, 1911 by Kandinsky, he usually separates the lines and the colors in a way to uh, just like a, a composition, a melodic improvisation, realize uh, combinations that could be the equivalent of music. A strong major arc is shown that give attention, just like echoes, some others are vibrating nearby. Uh, the gravity is having no link at all with reality. Things seems to float, to be shocking each other. Great tensions are generated by those arcs, by the blue. Uh, usually, uh, Kadinsky thinks that uh, colors more than sound could also be the equivalent of musical instrument. Red could be as a tuba, strong in the harmony. Blue, dark, could be like a piano. Pale blue could be like flutes. In those ideas, he will be one of the major artists linking his ideas with synesthesia, making equivalences between different types of art. Uh, this is the really beginning of the researches about abstraction developed by Kandinsky. A little bit later, as a Kunstmeister, a master of art in the Bauhaus school, he will develop geometrical compositions, a new step in abstractions. Uh, this man is really a major artist of the 20th century, and we have the chance in the Pompidou Center to have almost all the periods uh, all the stars that he had developed through his existence. You may know it, he died in Neuilly, very close to Paris. And we've been happy uh, in a certain way to have in the legacy a major sound uh, offered at that time. I was talking about uh, the abstraction we will rise with Kadinsky and some others. And was talking also about the development with abstraction. One major artist is also on display in our collections. This is Pete Mondrian, who will make of abstraction one of his major research too. Pete Mondrian spent a long time in Paris. Uh, this man had a quest. He wanted to reach with his painting a certain idea about harmony. Uh, spirituality is something that he linked with his painting, just like Kandinsky in a certain way. In his researches in Paris, he has combined black lines with white backgrounds using primary colors in different compositions. He was close to this idea of balance, but uh, times became difficult. Harmony was not there anymore when World War II started. So Kadinsky has decided to move to uh, New York City. We have the chance to have one of the first painting he made at this specific time. It's uh, another place to create for Kandinsky, but this is also a big shock for this artist. Uh, if in Paris he had a certain idea about harmony, what he discovered in New York is totally different. He is totally amazed by the energy, the vibration of the city. Fernand Léger was saying of New York City that it was the biggest show on, uh, in the world.
And this painting shows the changes who appears in uh, Pete Mondrian works. But where usually black lines are becoming colored lines, just like a tapestry, just like a, a canvas, the lines are circulating one under the other, over the other, creating circulations. He still used the primary colors, but he used them also in an idea which is essential, the idea of plants. If you use color in a painting, it's already an idea about space. Usually yellow goes up, red is a color that usually attracts your eyes, but is located in the middle, and blue is deep creating a background. So he gives only, or not only circulations with lines, but he also creates depths, different uh, proportions. Uh, the energy will be so intense that um, uh, some other paintings like Broadway Boogie Woogie will go further in those directions. If I'm talking about Boogie Woogie or Bebop, you have to know one thing. I was talking about the equivalency made by Kandinsky about painting and music, but Pim Mondrian was a dancer. He was loving to dance and he was fascinated by jazz. He doesn't only discover in New York uh, the energy of a new city, but he will also discover a new rhythm that will be directly painted on this specific canvas. When we've been trying to find uh, what were the very important pieces of our collections, of course, we've been searching in our collections, historical pieces, masters who produced paintings that were sculptures, artworks that were very important for them. But we also pay attention to uh, the, the public. Um, this portrait uh, made by Otto Dix, is usually uh, uh, extremely uh, important for the public. The viewers are uh, many times amazed by this portrait of uh, Celia von Arden. If you look at it the first time, maybe uh, your questions will be, what is the gender of such a character? And uh, painting is dealing with tensions. Is it a male? Is it a female? Is it a travestite? The colors are red, uh, uh, are showing maybe uh, some kind of alarm, warning, or it could be something linked with passion or desire. Uh, dated 1926, this painting could be an echo to uh, the fashion of a moment. In Paris, we would have said of this lady that she's a garçon. Yasun were ladies that were emancipating themselves after World War I. Many ladies had the occasion to work like men were doing. And the way to emancipate, they don't wear the same costumes, just like men were doing, having costume close to the body, so do they. Um, smoking and drinking is not a vice in the idea of Otto Dix. It's just a way to express that she do what she feel to do. Um, the haircut is very symbolic of this Gerson style. Uh, one thing is very interesting uh, is that um, this lady uh, uh, went in exile in uh, Great Britain and she said that um, she met Otto Dix as she was standing in a cafe in Berlin called Romanische Cafe. It's a cafe which is known for the specific Art Nouveau style. If you uh, come to Paris, you will see the same style on the subway gates. And he rushed to her, Otto Dix, and said to her, I have to make a portrait of you. You are Germany. 
It's not only uh, the portrait of a journalist, Sylvia von Arden. According to a tradition, it's also the portrait of a nation. What does he want to express with a portrait supposed to be Germany? In fact, this man is extremely cruel with his country. Maybe you know the works he has made after World War I. This man spent four years on the front line. He's been devastated about what he saw. You can't believe in beauty anymore. Why do you think that artists should paint beauty if they don't believe in it? He don't believe in his country. It's a country that tries to give a presence, but which is defeated. If some are having good time, the soldiers are for some of them beggars in the street. That's what he paints. He wants to show the contrast, the tensions that he feels in this nation. And this portrait maybe is one of the most symbolic of that specific time. Um, the artist was not believing in modernity that brought the great chaos. And in a certain way, he preferred to turn to the past and uh, admiring Holbein, Hanak, or Durer, he paints a little bit like them. Uh, it's one of the rare modern painters that paints in an ancient style with ancient techniques. He paints on wood. He paints with a technique called tempera that uh, gives this uh, glossy, uh, glittering aspect to the painting. And um, you can imagine also that if he represents Germany in 1926, it will not be uh, in the ideals developed by the Nazi a little bit later. This artist will be considered as a degenerated artist. That makes also a specific link with history uh, in the way it's presented. He belongs to a specific German movement called Neues Aschlichkeit, New Objectivity. Um, it's interesting to note also one thing. Uh, if you think that being modern, means change the rules, the habit of painting. He doesn't belong to this idea. He paints just like an old master, but I guess no one has been representing so truly the between war in Germany that is essential uh, in the propositions of the collections. Surrealism is definitely uh, one of uh, the biggest movement of the 20th century. It's definitely the longest. Um, in 1924, André Breton will uh, write a book called The Manifest of Surrealism that will link many artists to the movement throughout the 20th century. It's André Breton who uh, give us the chance to have a work from Frida Kahlo in our collections. Uh, André Breton will go to Mexico, meet uh, Diego Rivera and Frida Kahlo, and will propose her to uh, have an exhibition in Paris after the huge success she will have in an exhibition in New York. Uh, both in uh, 1939 by a French museum, this is the first work bought by a public institution uh, from uh, Frida Kahlo. We're happy to say, too, that it's the only work from Frida Kahlo on display in a museum in Europe. Uh, Frida Kahlo is famous for painting the pains of her life, disabled. She had an accident, a severe accident, that will um, give her a, a lot of problems throughout her life. She's also a woman in love with somebody which is cruel in love. She uh, was the column, as uh, Diego Rivera was the elephant. She's been crushed in love many times by this man. And she painted throughout her painting uh, the elements of, of this specific life. She's also uh, very linked to uh, the roots of uh, Mexican culture. This specific painting called The Frame makes an echo to uh, the workshop of a country. Uh, the flowers were surrounding the self-portrait. 
uh, traditional in Mexican culture. And she represented himself, as she did in so many self-portraits, uh, as a, um, an iconic figure. Uh, she used, in fact, a specific frame that sometimes shows Virgin Mary's religious subjects or family photos. Uh, she uh, is um, famous for the representation of her own face. Um, painted on glass and aluminum. Uh, this is a, a, a very small painting, but characteristic of the art of Frida Kahlo. Um, André Breton was saying uh, she's a ribbon around a bomb. And that's uh, maybe uh, what would be uh, the description uh, of uh, uh, Frida Kahlo. And uh, for this short presentations of uh, the uh, VIP pieces. Uh, I'm going to end in a huge room devoted to uh, um, an artist we really appreciate in the Pompidou Center, uh, Joanne Micho. As you can see, this is a triptych, a very big piece. Uh, Joan Miro has been linked uh, at the beginning with the surreal movement. I was talking about uh, André Breton, who uh, is uh, the writer of the manifest. He was extremely impressed by uh, the early works of Joan Miro. Arriving in Paris, uh, Miro, uh, just like the other great Spanish painter, Picasso will be amazed by what he discovers in the city and will try to change his habits, try to assassinate the painting, like he said. Uh, if he had in the beginning a very uh, precious, just like miniaturist detail period, he will try step by step to simplify his painting. And one of the earliest series that will be noticed in Paris are called the dream paintings. Blue is a very specific color for Joan Miro. He said that uh, maybe he became painter as he was a young boy. He said one night he was amazed to see a star that seems to go through the sky. He said since that day I was licking the sky and spitting the blue, blue became the color of my dreams. Maybe that's what is painting on this triptych, the color of his dreams. But in 1961, uh, Joan Miro is an old man. He has the experience. Just like a Japanese arrow, uh, he said that he's been thinking for a very long time about the elements should be installed. Uh, Picasso was saying about Miro, if there's something on display, it has to be there and nowhere else. Uh, for sure, it's a dialogue between void and melody. Uh, the elements seem to be so fragile, moving from one part to the others. The dark spots are giving faraway echoes as the red is a pulse that gives life in this page of silence. It's a uh, almost a, a zen, maybe, moment. Um, many viewers are coming to this room and are sensitive about the silence that uh, it may occur. And this is in this zen room, maybe, that uh, I will uh, receive the questions that uh, you may give me. Uh, I guess it's the perfect place with the dreams of uh, Joan Miro to uh, lessen to uh, the questions you may give me. Thank you, Olivier, for this wonderful presentation. And looking at the comments in the, ch in the, in the chat box, I can see that a lot of people are really appreciating this, this private uh, tour um, at Centre Pompidou. So let's have a look at, uh, at the questions uh, from the audience. Uh, yes. So Daniela is asking, how does the museum get the paintings? Is it buying it 
or borrowing it or both? Um, in fact, uh, all the, the works who are in the collections are just like the treasure of the nation. They belong to the nation. Um, to uh, talk about how they came to the collection is extremely virus, the way it came. Of course, like many other museums, we have a budget that allows us to buy some works. But um, you may know the prices on the art market. You may know the crisis that uh, Europe is going through. It's not the most important way that we have uh, such a beautiful collections. Artists have been extremely generous during their times. At the early beginning of the collections, people like Picasso, Matisse, Kadinsky uh, gave some important pieces to the collections. But to be honest with you, it's the principle of dation, which is one of the major ways to have works in our collections. Uh, instead of paying taxes for legacy, uh, the government is having uh, huge pieces that come to complete our collections. Uh, maybe by oppositions to other museums, just like in the US or England, we don't have the possibility to sell or exchange some works. Once they are in the collections, they cannot be uh, in other places. So these are some of the keys maybe, or some of the ways that we have been uh, completing our collections. And actually um, the Pompidou Center is having um, a huge uh, politic about uh, the acquisitions that uh, make the contemporary sections uh, also very important. Thank you. Um, a question from Ariadna. How many masterpieces does the center have? How many, excuse me? Masterpieces. How oh. many? Yeah. <laughs> um, the, the, my first question would be, uh, what do you call a masterpiece? We made an exhibition in uh, Pompidou uh, Metz uh, saying, what is a masterpiece? Um, I would be tempted that uh, we have 120,000 works in our collections. Maybe we have 120,000 masterpieces. But um, I would say maybe that uh, we have like uh, maybe 10 or 15% of the pieces were essential. It's extremely difficult to define what is a masterpiece. Yeah. Uh, I can imagine. So I think that's a very, very good answer, actually. Uh, <laughs> what is your favorite painting in San Francisco? Your uh, personal favorite? Oh, uh, that, that's a, an extremely subjective uh, answer, of course, I'm going to give you. Um, you know, I think that art is a question of dialogue. Sometimes some artists are making extremely good things to me. Sometimes I'm a little bit tired of what I see. So just like a pathology, I would say that sometimes I'm extremely pleased about uh, seeing a Matisse. Some other times Picasso shakes me a little bit more and makes me a more uh, uh, happiness. But the artists, of course, that have a special place in my heart. I'm extremely sensitive to uh, the works of Joanne Miro uh, we actually are facing. It's an artist I really admire. I like uh, his simplicity. Maybe uh, he said that he wanted to be a painter as he was a kid. I like the kid high he gave me. Uh, sometimes by seeing too much things, uh, I may be uh, not uh, be amazed. And Joan Miro makes me feel like a kid that opened my eyes to the world. Uh, that's why I appreciate in his works. Actually, a question related to uh, Joan Miro. Um, mm -hmm. Are these, and this question is coming from, uh, from Yaume, are these three pictures of Joan Miro uh, meant to always be exhibited together? Is it a series? Yes, it, it's a series. Uh, uh, you were, we were talking about uh, how we get uh, different pieces in the collections. Uh, the quest of the Pompidou Center was to have the three of them. At the beginning, we had only two. The third one came a little bit lately. But now, this triptych has been thought by Joan Miro as an ensemble 
it has to be shown as an ensemble. Uh, the ideal way of presentation, of course, is to show the triptych together. Uh, Grand Bleu 1, Grand Bleu 2, Grand Bleu 3 are an ensemble of the uh, same, uh, um, same installation. I had the chance to see them in different places. Uh, each time is a rediscovery. I've seen them installed in uh, Pompidou Metz. I've seen them in Le Grand Palais. Each time is like they're a little bit different, even if there were always the three of them on display. Great. Uh, a question from uh, Gaston. Dear Olivier, thank you for the interesting tour. Like the Eiffel Tower and Pompidou, Firstly resisted by the Parisians and then adopted as part of the landmarks of the city. In your opinion, which is the next polemic building that might be considered in the future as a landmark? <laughs> I, like, I like the link uh, uh, this uh, auditor made with the Eiffel Tower. I guess there's something a little bit similar. What saved the uh, Eiffel Tower, you may know it, was the function used as an antenna became functional. Uh, now it's uh, aesthetic more than functional. Uh, the functions were shown on the Pompidou Center. I've created the polemic about the buildings. I guess we are Parisians. Maybe you know Paris. We love polemics. When a new building is appearing, they are always polemics, but fastly, we admit them. Uh, Les Colonnes de Buren, for example, in Palais Royal, the Pyramid of Le Louvre, I've created polemics. The latest building that made polemics was a building made by Renzo Piano, an architect of the Pompidou Center. It's the great tribunal of justice, which is one of the highest buildings now on display on, on the surroundings of Paris. But I guess uh, if it's criticized for the moment, maybe it will be admitted in uh, a few days, in a few years. Well, let's see. Who knows? Uh, Leonard is uh, <laughs> thanking you for this wonderful tour. Um, how many visitors does the museum have in a normal year? Because he can't wait to return. <laughs> Yeah, of course, we can not talk about the normal year for this time. For the best years, uh, we have reached almost uh, three or four million visitors, which is an amazing number for a modern museum. Uh, I guess we must be number five uh, of all the buildings uh, who are visited in Paris after the Eiffel Tower, Le Louvre, Notre Dame, uh, but the competition now is no more with Notre Dame. Uh, but it's definitely, I guess, this is our, our pride, one of the most visited museums uh, for modern and country art, which is uh, not easy in a traditional city like Paris. The competition with Le Louvre or Le Musée d'Orsay, which are usually what people are seeing first, makes us um, uh, a special place. But things are changing. Uh, the, Younger generations are now uh, maybe more sensitive to art and things are changing. Uh, a question from Mona Lee. Does the museum have paintings made by French artists only or are you also exhibiting paintings from oh, no. artists around the no, world? It would be, oh no, it would be terrible to show only French painters. Uh, you know, um, Paris uh, have been attracting uh, artists coming from all horizons. Um, talking about the modern period, at the uh, late 19th century and beginning of the 20th centuries, Montmartre was an essential place for the artist. Van Gogh from Holland, we spent a long time in Paris. So a little bit later, Montparnasse will attract artists coming from all over the world, Americans from Eastern Europe, Paris is known as a multicultural city and the museum has to represent art in all ways and not only a French typical museum. Um, no, it's not uh, the um, pretension of uh, the museum to show only French. Uh, those are all the sources of uh, art who are on display. We even sometimes do focus specifically on the other points of view. 
three or four years ago, we uh, made a specific exhibition that was showing modernity in Asia, modernity in Africa, in South America. Uh, if you read sometimes art history, like in historians, everything seems to be focused on Europe and just like if modernity was not existing somewhere else. So, no, we try to show all the points of view are possible. Possible, sorry. Um, two more questions. Um, is there from Jeanette? Is there a large collection in reserve, and do the exhibits rotate a great deal? Oh, of course. Uh, as I said in the introduction, we've got more than 120,000 works in our collections. It would be a really a, a damage, a pity. Uh, not to show all the um, artworks uh, that we uh, uh, that we have, so the rotations are definitely uh, once per year, sometimes faster. Uh, we change all the hangings every year, but more regularly, uh, some rooms are changed. So. If ever you say uh, you came already to the Pompidou Center, I know what's on display. I'm tempted to tell you, you came to the Pompidou Center one time, but you have to come back because things change very regularly. Uh, I'm working in this place for 20 years. I wouldn't be happy to find always the same thing at the same place. What I appreciate in this museum is that it's a living museum. Things are changing. The temporary exhibitions are very often uh, shown on the higher levels. We uh, have uh, four, five, or six sometimes uh, huge uh, uh, temporary exhibitions. But the, in the permanent collections, where I've been guiding you this morning, we regularly change uh, the hangings too, of course. Well, the questions keep coming in, so, <laughs> and we still have time. Um, Hira is asking, uh, are there any Dali paintings in Centre Pompidou? <laughs> yes, Dali is a very popular artist with the audience. Um, we've got the chance to have major artworks from Dali. Um, for example, we've got uh, the Enigma of uh, William Tell, which is uh, one of the first paintings he made when he appeared in Paris after he left Spain and will join uh, the Surreal group uh, six apparitions of Lenin on the piano is also a major artwork of our collections. Uh, we have, uh, if I'm not wrong, something like five or six major paintings and of course uh, several uh, drawings. Well, more or less uh, regularly on these plates, the problem was the drawings, but of course Dali is extremely well represented in the museum. Uh, I must say that we are proud to uh, have presented uh, one of the biggest retrospective of the artist, who have uh, the, I guess, the um, most important number of visitors for uh, 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 um, an exhibition here in the Pompidou Center. Did Yves Saint Laurent donate pieces or funds to buy pieces? If so, can you tell which pieces he bought? Um, I know that with Pierre Berger, Yves Saint Laurent uh, were some uh, curators that were uh, uh, donators that were very important. Uh, actually, I don't remember exactly which pieces we've got so many donators have been given, but I can tell you one thing. You may know it when Yves Saint Laurent died. Uh, his fascinating collection has been sold and we bought from the Yves Saint Laurent collection, an important painting uh, from Giorgio de Quirico. So it works both ways. We bought some elements of the collection of Yves Saint Laurent, and Yves Saint Laurent and Pierre Berger have been given to the Pompidou Center found or pieces that are now uh, important in our collections. A win-win situation. <laughs> yes. So, <laughs> So uh, these actually were the questions and uh, uh, there's actually one, one other comment from Ariadna uh, just saying that she really uh, uh, loved to see how you enjoy speaking about art and how you tell about art. She really appreciates the tour. Thank you. And I think uh, with her, 
lots of other people did. Um, and basically the question, we ran out of the questions. Um, so that's all for today. Thank you, Thank everybody. You. Thank uh, you. The, the next step will be you will have to come <laughs> to the yes. Pompidou Center. And uh, if you like a guided visit, uh, you, you'll find uh, very regularly in the Pompidou Center guided tours that will, I uh, hope you make you feel uh, the, the same way. Thank yeah. you for your, for, your, for, for your listening. All right. So uh, I would also, from our end, would like to thank all the participants uh, for joining uh, this Ticket to Awakening Weeks and this virtual experience. When you're in France, you can also experience France reawakenings in person, like Olivier mentioned. Uh, so visit the tickets.com slash blog slash awakening weeks for information on all our awakening weeks around the world, including this one. So again, thank you, Olivier, for this wonderful tour. It was yes. really very interesting and insightful. Uh, and not only a big thank you to you, but also for your team for pulling this together. Um, and uh, again, a big thank you for everybody uh, that joined this uh, virtual tour. And we are looking forward to finding more ways to culture with you again very soon. Thank you all and have a nice day. Merci, au revoir, à bientôt, au Centre Pompidou. Au revoir.